Within Greek mythology, Poseidon was the god, small g, of the seas. Poseidon would be sought in prayer by sailors in hopes of a safe voyage. It was believed that when Poseidon would become angry, he would strike the ground with his trident and cause earthquakes and shipwrecks and drownings. Even Alexander the Great resorted to praying to Poseidon before casting a four-horse chariot into the sea in hopes of appeasing the great Poseidon prior to battle. Zeus was the Greek god of the sky and thunder. His throne was in Mount Olympus. Zeus was revered as a god of gods, a god to whom other gods would bow. He was supreme over the heavens and would have control over the weather. Encyclopedia Britannica says, from his exalted position atop Mount Olympus, Zeus was thought to omnisciently observe the affairs of men, seeing everything, governing all, and rewarding good conduct and punishing evil. Gaia, also known as Mother Earth, was the Greek goddess who created this universe and gave birth to many important gods. Before Gaia came into being, all was chaos and disarray. Gaia came into existence as Earth, and from her came the stars. Sounds strangely similar to Genesis 1. All three of these mythical deities are a testament to Paul's warning in his letter to the Romans that man would become futile in his thinking and instead of honoring the one true God would instead foolishly worship and serve the created rather than the creator. Poseidon, Zeus, and Gaia were all sinners. They became prideful and angry. They were exceedingly sexually promiscuous. They had weaknesses. They were not all-powerful. They could not provide a remedy for man's most dire problem, sin. Only Jesus, the God-man who lived a sinless life and provided himself as a sacrifice, could rise from the dead and plead his own blood to the Father and thus rise to the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The title of our sermon this morning in Genesis 1 verses 20 through 25 is Sultan of the Seas, Sovereign of the Skies, Lord of the Land. Look with me at verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. So first the land produces vegetation and trees and plants. We looked at that last time. And now God commands the waters to produce. Is there anyone that you've ever run across that whenever they speak, everyone seems to hush and listen? In fact, they command their audience's attention, whether that be an audience of one or a room full. It may be someone who rarely speaks, or perhaps someone that is extremely intelligent or just enjoyable to listen to. We all know these people. We've met them. They command our attention. I think this phrase here in verse 20 is interesting. And God said. God's words are more than profound. They are more than intelligent They are more than enjoyable. They do more than inspire. They do more than simply bring about emotion in an individual. They even do more than simply proclaim. They corporealize. They bring about an effect. They actualize. They materialize. They bring to fruition God's words act, they accomplish, they are the mechanism by which anything comes into being and subsists. They convey life. They 
generate laws of nature, they supersede those same laws as evidenced in Jesus' phrase, peace, be still. Through God's words, a soul is born. And by the words of God, anything that he wills is most certainly accomplished. And God said. And what did he say? Let the waters bring forth abundantly. Literally, let the waters swarm. This is the Hebrew word sharatz. Sharatz. The Hebrew word means to team or to swarm. And according to the Bible sense lexicon, the sense of this word is to move about quickly in large numbers, often with a random appearance. It's like a team or a shoal of fish. The English word words used here, bring forth abundantly, is definitely the idea of this word, but the definition is to swarm. According to one Bible dictionary, the word means to multiply or an innumerable multiplication. So the waters were to multiply or to swarm with an innumerable amount of what? Of sheretz. That's the Hebrew word. The water was supposed to sheretz with sheretz. Literally, it was supposed to swarm with swarms or swarmers. Sheretz is the verb to swarm, and sheretz in Hebrew is the noun, which is a swarm or swarmers. Uh, the word is not only used in the Old Testament of fish, but also of insects and reptiles. And it's according to one Bible dictionary, anything that moves in large numbers. So, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarmers. There was something very distinct, however, about these swarms or teams or shoals. Did you notice what was distinct about them in the phrase, in the verse that we just read? Something that up until this point, the creation narrative, in the creation narrative, has been non-existent when it comes to created matter. They were alive. They were creatures with life, living creatures. This is the first time that this word appears in Genesis. It's the Hebrew word nefesh. And the word goes on to appear about uh, another 752 times in the Old Testament. The meaning of nefesh is multifaceted and is translated as life, soul, person, and living most commonly. And the word, the Hebrew word hai is here as well. The Hebrew word hai means living or alive. So the passage could literally read, let the waters swarm with swarming living lives. That's the Hebrew. Let the waters swarm with swarming living lives. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living lives. But we understand the nuance from the context. And so it would, would be better translated, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And so God calls forth the waters to bring about fish. And oh, did he create a lot of fish. There are billions of fish in the sea. Some estimates say trillions, even up to three to five trillion fish in the sea. There are so many fish that as I researched it, uh, many say that it's impossible to even estimate how many fish are in the sea, especially because some go to such great depths uh, that no human can reach those depths to uh, provide an estimate. One article on fish in our ocean described one of God's creations, recently discovered, actually. Pseudoloparis soiree, the deepest fish in the dark abyss of the Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench, about 27,000 feet down, lives the deepest fish ever discovered. The Mariana snailfish 
is a tadpole-like two to four inch creature that's much more successful than it looks. This small translucent fish appears to be the top predator of her underworld. Human divers cannot go where Mariana snailfish swim, but an international research team did sink cameras and traps deep into this difficult to reach and rarely studied area over three years. The traps took four hours to fall from the ocean surface to where this snailfish swims. When raised, they held healthy, well-fed snailfish and the camera footage had captured their deep sea activities. Scientists believe that 27,000 feet is a physiological limit for fish and that below this depth, none can survive. Does this beg a question in your mind? Why would God create fish in the depths of the ocean that we may never see? We've discovered the Pseudolopara suare, the deepest fish. We think that it's the deepest fish and it was only discovered recently. And so why would God create fish in the depths of the ocean that we might never see? For his glory. The psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Isaiah says the whole earth is full of his glory and we must give him glory for his omnipotent power that cannot be matched. Our gripes and complaints and doubts about our creator really seem insignificant and petty when we consider just the wonder of the sea, of the fish in the sea. God will be glorified. Every time a new discovery like this comes about, he is glorified and we must give him glory. What unsurpassed knowledge and creativity contained in the mind of our God, the Sultan of the seas. Look at the second half of verse 20. And fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And so God fills the seas with living lives, living creatures, fish. And now he'll fill the firmament or the expanse, or as we call it, the sky. And so he fills the sky with fowls or with birds. Now, this sentence here is actually a command. If you read it, and fowl that may fly, it appears to be in a different mood than the imperative mood. The verb for fly is actually incorrectly translated as that may fly. The Hebrew verb for fly is in the jussive mood. All right, here's a little Hebrew lesson. Now, a mood or a mode in language tells us how the verb is being used. So if I say the bird is flying, I'm using the indicative mood. If I'm I'm simply stating a fact, the bird is flying. If I say, is the bird flying? I'm still using the same verb flying, but I'm using the interrogative mood. I'm asking a question. And if I look at a bird and I say, bird, fly, I'm giving a command. It's still the same verb, but it's a different mood. It's the imperative mood. Now, the jussive mood does not exist in English, but it does in Hebrew. And the jussive is like our English imperative mood. And so it is a command. And so therefore, this word here in the Hebrew is in the jussive case, God is actually issuing a command, let the birds fly rather than fowl that may fly. So it simply parallels the previous phrase. So he says, let the water swarm with swarmers that are alive and let the birds fly. And this uh, coincides and, and agrees with the rest of the creation narrative where God is continually commanding things to come into existence. So he commands the birds to come into existence and he commands the fish to come into existence. Let the fowl that may fly or let the fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now, 
Don't let this creative act pass you by. Don't let the creative act of the birds pass you by. I say that because even in preparing for these sermons in Genesis 1, it is very easy to write an explanation, do a little bit of studying, and then move on to the next verse. And I would say it's easy for us to do that when we read our Bibles as well, to just simply read it, we know it, we've heard it, it's old news, and we move on. But please don't let what God created here pass you by like a bullet point in a Sunday school lesson. God invented birds. He came up with them. Consider one's, one commentator's description of birds. It is truly astonishing with what care, wisdom, and minute skill God has formed the different genera and species of birds, whether intended to live chiefly on land or in water. The structure of a single feather affords a world of wonders. That's evidenced by my children, who anytime they see a feather, they want to pick it up and hold it and keep it and bring it home and even sleep with it. And as God made the fowls that they may fly in the firmament of heaven, Genesis 1.20, so he has adapted the form of their bodies and the structure and disposition of their plumage for that very purpose. The head and neck in flying are drawn principally within the breastbone so that the whole under part exhibits the appearance of a ship's hull. The wings are made use of as sails or rather oars and the tail as a helm or rudder. By means of these, the creature is not only able to preserve the center of gravity, but also to go with vast speed through the air, either straight forward, circularly, or in any kind of angle, upwards or downwards. In these also, God has shown his skill and his power in the great and in the little in the vast ostrich and cassowary, and in the beautiful hummingbird, which in plumage excels the splendor of the peacock and in size is almost on a level with the bee." End quote. What a truly terrifyingly wonderful God, the sovereign of the skies. Look with me at verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. And on this day, God created whales. Now, the Hebrew word here is limited by the word, uh, the, by the English word here, whales. The Hebrew word is tanin, and the word is actually speaking of large sea creatures or reptiles. And it's translated throughout scripture as sea monsters, serpents, and dragons. So uh, it, it's used narrowly here uh, as, as whales, but it actually has a much more general sense to it um, and uh, is inclusive uh, not only of whales, though they, were, they are in view here as large sea creatures, but using the word whales is too narrow in this context. So here on day five, God creates crocodiles, large snakes, certain kinds of dinosaurs, sharks, and yes, whales. Uh, these are not like the fish that swarm in shoals or in schools. These were dominant, unignorable creatures of the deep. We admire these creatures. We view them in museums. We take whale watching tours. We marvel at snakes. We marvel at dinosaur bones that have been reconstructed to show their form. These creatures are the subject of many fables like Moby Dick. Dragons have been used as antagonists and tropes throughout literature for millennia. These were truly admirable sea creatures. And God created the whales. And every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, look at this phrase in verse 21, and every living creature. 
that moveth. Now, this clearly doesn't mean every single creature ever created. Why? Well, because we know that some moving creatures were not created until day six. So this phrase is only in the context of those creatures that are in the water or aquatic creatures. So basically, God is pointing out some of the more notable creatures when he mentions the larger sea creatures. And then he mentions that he created all the others. So let the waters uh, team, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And God created the large, uh, unignorable sea creatures. And then he created all the others. And God created all of the birds on day five as well. And he created them to reproduce after their kinds. My favorite bird is the eagle. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to see an eagle up close two, on two different occasions. Uh, once Allie and I visited uh, the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon. Uh, and I was able to see a golden eagle for the first time up close, right uh, through a through a cage. It was, I was about five feet from the golden eagle. That is a majestic bird. And the second time I had visited uh, the Capilano Suspension Bridge in North Vancouver, and one of the employees uh, in the park was holding a bald eagle on this long leather glove, and uh, you were able to walk up and be within within a proximity of about six or seven feet from this from this bald eagle. And when you look at a bald eagle, either up close or just soaring through the air, or you see video footage of it coming down out of the sky and catching a large fish out of the water, um, these creatures just can't help but display the glory of God in their grand design. And their very presence demands our attention. So God saw that it was good, and there's no argument from me here. What a good, good creation by a good, good God. So verse 22, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. What does it mean to bless someone? Well, it can mean a few different things to bless someone. Here, the Bible says that God blessed them. He blessed what he had just created. He blessed the fish, and he blessed the birds. And so what is a blessing? What does it mean when God says, be blessed? Well, the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semantic Domains defines bless as commend or to speak words invoking divine favor. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I want you to be blessed. I'm invoking that God would show his favor on you. Okay, that's one meaning of the word bless. And it's with the intent that the object of the blessing will have favorable circumstances or a favorable state at a future time. Uh, Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Lexicon provides the meanings uh, blessed or adored. So when we say that we bless God or the psalmist says bless the Lord, it, it is the idea of adoring God. So this is a different, different definition than when we are actually invoking blessing on someone else and calling down divine favor on, on someone else. Uh, another definition is prospered by God. That's that same idea of invoking blessing on someone or, or calling down blessing on someone. Uh, another, another idea of blessing is to have prosperity invoked. And still again, another definition of blessing is the idea of gratitude. Uh, you might give someone, give uh, some monetary help to someone, and they might say, bless you, and that's the idea of, of gratitude. So there's several different definitions that um, are in play when it comes to the word bless. In this case, it would be appropriate to conclude that God was providing a blessing of prosperity or of multiplication in this case. And he follows the word blessing with the blessing itself. Be fruitful and multiply. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. So God creates procreation on day five. And this reproduction would be abundant. 
The fish would fill the waters in the seas. The birds would multiply on the earth. And from the very creation of nephesh, or life, God creates it to be fertile. God blessed it. So the blessing is the ability or the capacity to propagate. Now, God created a creation that multiplies. It's, it's already astounding that one can create something out of nothing. And it's more astounding that one could create living beings out of nothing that can continue to multiply themselves. Look at verse 23. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So day five is over. The earth completed another spin on its axis and continues its orbit around the newly formed sun. And day five begs some interesting questions. God took such great care in developing each animal and its task. So what does that say about us? Well, Jesus answered that in Matthew 6, verse 26. He said, behold, the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And so, what should the remembrance of day five of creation, as we look at the beautiful birds in our backyard, motivate in us? Seeking the kingdom of God. Let day five of creation motivate you to seek the kingdom of God. The next time you see a school of fish, the next time you see a flock of Canadian geese, or a stately owl, or a magnificent bald eagle, or a mighty orca, or a meandering alligator or crocodile, be reminded that your first priority is seeking the kingdom of God. Be reminded that Jesus, the creator, looked to day five of creation to remind us not to seek what unbelievers seek, desire God's kingdom. But there's another question that day five of creation begs. Why did God populate the seas and the land with animals? And specifically, why did God populate the seas and land with animals that reproduce? Have you ever thought about that question? And a simple answer to it would be, yes, for the glory of God. Or you might say for man's enjoyment. You might say for God's enjoyment. But why did God populate the lands and the seas with birds, with fish that reproduce? Have you ever asked that question? Well, we already established in our introductory sermon to Genesis that before the beginning, before verse 1, in the beginning, God was already decreeing the mystery of Christ. He was already deciding that we should do good works. And so God, on day five, created what would become man's sustenance after the fall. There was in creation a preparation for the fall. The fish and the birds would die after the fall, but the fish and the birds would live on by virtue of their fertility. And thus God creates on day five the propagation that would benefit his crowning creation, man. So God creates man knowing that they will fall into sin, knowing that his threat of death would actually become a reality. And had God just simply created a finite amount of fish or a finite amount of birds or a finite amount of land animals or even a finite amount of plants, man would have survived for a time. But God was, since he was already preparing Christ to come to earth and die prior to the beginning, here in creation, he makes preparation for man's sustenance after the fall. Look at verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So on day five, 
God made the sea produce living creatures. He made the sky fill with living creatures. And now on day six, he makes the earth, or more specifically the land, the dry land, produce living creatures. And so the whole earth will be filled with life, nephesh. He says, let the land produce living lives, living lives. So what living lives were these? Well, he created cattle, or we might call it livestock. Generally, when we think of cattle, we think of cows. Uh, Livestock in our modern vernacular vernacular is far more general in nature, and it could include cows, bulls, pigs, sheep, goats, horses, mules, buffalo, camels, etc. These were essentially animals that are raised for the use or pleasure of humans, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. The Hebrew word is translated throughout the Old Testament over 100 times, mostly as cattle, animal, or beast. And the word also could have encompassed many other kinds of animals. But here when he he says, and God made, or let the earth bring forth the the living creature, the cattle, these are generally uh, animals that could be domesticated, animals that, that could be used, that man could use for farming or for transportation, um, the, or for for raising uh, for food. The other class of animals that God created were, look here in, in uh, verse 24, creeping things. Creeping things. Sounds kind of creepy. Uh, what were these? Well, uh, this is the Hebrew word remes. Remes. The, the Hebrew sense lexicon describes the sense of remes as a small moving thing. Uh, or small animals, including reptiles, that move along land or water, possibly by creeping, hence creeping things. So these were small animals that seemed to creep. And one could also say that they move along the ground. These could be lizards or other reptiles. Uh, They could denote the creation of insects, such as caterpillars or spiders, which are definitely creepy. They are small animals Uh, like reptiles, rodents, and insects, creeping things. And then there's a third class here in in verse 24 of of animals, the beast of the earth, the beast of the earth. Now, when one reads of a beast uh, in Genesis 1 on creation week, perhaps the animal that might come to mind is a Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the largest dinosaurs and and meanest, uh, a beast Uh, Indeed, large dinosaurs were created here on day six when the beast was created. But the term is much broader than that. These would be any undomesticated large land animals. So in view here would be bears, lions, dinosaurs, hyenas, wolves, elephants, etc. Animals that we might look at and say that's a beast So verse 24 covers these three classes of animals which cover all the different types of land animals. You have livestock, you have creeping things or small animals or insects that move along the ground, uh, and then you have the beasts of the earth, large, wild, uh, carnivorous, undomesticated uh, animals. One commentator summarizes the verse this way. Probably three kinds of animals in 24 are broadly what we should call domesticated animals, small creatures, and game. Chrysostom in the 4th century said this, It wasn't simply for our use that he produced all these things. It was also for our benefit, in the sense that we might see the overflowing abundance of his creatures and be overwhelmed at the creator's power and be in a position to know that all these things were produced by a certain wisdom and ineffable love out of regard for the human being that was destined to come into being. Verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And in these beasts, in these creeping things, in these livestock, what magnificent design was displayed by our God, the Lord of the land. I hope 
that you are as excited as I am to look next time at God's crowning creation, man and woman. But until then, I leave you with this. God's handiwork is everywhere. God's greatness has been on display since the creation of the world. So as you live and move and have your being, your life, let what you see draw the eyes of your heart to what you cannot see. Seek God's kingdom first. Meaning, live like a citizen of a different country, of a heavenly one. Live lives in keeping with repentance. Let's pray.